What's important? What do you want? Just say a quick welcome to everyone. Thanks for coming. And um, I'm going to play a little bit differently today uh, in that uh, when I set this up initially, and actually I was talking with Ray from New Zealand, and, um, you know, he kind of encouraged me. I would said I'd come down and do a, a class for his dojo via Zoom since I didn't have to get on a plane. And then this whole COVID thing happened, and I sort of agreed to do four classes because I figured we were under house arrest for a month. And now, obviously, that's been extended. So I've kind of agreed to extend this at least, at least for this week and probably for the month of May. Let's see how it goes. But um, when I started, I had this kind of four classes in mind. And then, as I'm famous for doing, I was going to quit teaching again. And so I set up the four classes so that I could um, basically teach you everything I know. And I probably could have done it in one, but I stretched it out a little bit. Anyway, um, so I feel like in the, in the last four classes, I really have um, kind of condensed the main, the main themes of what it was I wanted to share. And uh, all those videos are, are posted at uh, the Create a Beautiful World website. Mm. Uh, I think at this point, at this point, anyway, you can go back and review any of that stuff that you want to. Thank you. There are also notes on um, the teachings that are there available um, that I posted to the website. and. Uh, I'm always available if you have any thoughts or questions or you couldn't find it or whatever. And uh, so kind of with that in mind, that the basics that I touched on were to cover the things that I thought were most important. I'd kind of like to go back and go over a couple of the fundamentals and then, and then explore with you. Um, I had actually asked that... Uh, when the invitation went out, it went out with a request that all of you uh, consider what was it that you learned in the sessions that we've spent together. I also asked in that set of questions, um, was there anything that you learned that you didn't expect? Was there anything that surprised you in the learnings? And then the third question I had asked was, um, is there anything you wanted to learn that you didn't get or you expected to get and, and we didn't touch on? And uh, I had hoped to get that put out and, uh, and get emails from everyone. But I'm, I'm going to move into a little more dialogic frame. So let me first off say what I always want to say to you if, you know, the world ends at the, this moment or the aliens come and take me. Listen to the impulse to breathe. I can't give you a more fundamental, a more accessible, a more powerful, a more consistent practice. Listening to the impulse to breathe, and I think you can immediately feel, as Bob calls it, it's a travel vehicle. It starts to shift the dimension of your awareness, the quality of your awareness, the quality of your presence, the quality of your being. And immediately, I, I to use Bob's terms, you're in a different dimension. Now, if that works for everyone, great. If not, uh, give me a different word. Please feel free to, to help me with that. And if it's not working for you in terms of you actually feeling a difference in the state of awareness, then please feel free to stop me and let's make sure that we get here. Because to me, this is the basics of our work. And it's what I want to come back to you with when I've asked also in every class, what's important and what is it that you want? And I'm hoping to talk a little bit more about that. The one more thing I'll say before I want to jump into some exercises, uh, some activity together. I want to play with uh, other travel vehicles, as Bob calls them, or other ways that we shift our dimension or our state of awareness. Uh, 
And to me, my focus has always been in what I call the awareness arts. And I came into Aikido out of yoga, both of which I studied because I knew they would help me in terms of my music. And I've always been kind of um, uh, a little bit in the closet as a dancer. I, I've always been very interested in the kinesthetic arts and the free form expression, both in music and dance. And uh, I also did a lot in improv theater. So I hope you're still with listening to the impulse to breathe. And that doesn't mean just noticing it, although that's a good start. It means listening to it. And I, my little joke about that is, you know, the difference between noticing it and listening to it or hearing it and listening to it is there were a lot of things my parents said to me as a kid and I heard them, but I just didn't listen. Okay. So if you're listening to the impulse to breathe, then the next travel vehicle or dimensional shift is seeking the source of the impulse to breathe. And allow me to say, I don't mean thinking about where it comes from. I mean, as you're feeling that, listening to and blending the known self with that, what should we call it, deeper or larger aspect or finer sense of yourself. If you feel into the origin, where does that feeling come? Where is that feeling coming from in you to begin with? And then as Mike pointed out last week, or as we had in our conversation, you know, uh, really what I said is if I ask you to take a breath and you do it, everybody take a deep breath and exhale, everybody knows that's you breathing. Then I tell you, if you don't do anything after a while, you'll notice that you're still breathing. Now, which you am I talking to? Or which you are you identifying as? And this blending of the two by listening with the conscious self to that universal connection. And I literally think of it as your spirit. And that's where the word inspiration comes from in terms of breathing. If you're doing that work, we should be experiencing a shift. If your intention is to seek the source or the origin of that impulse to breathe, we should be shifting again. And I would pause for just a moment here for anyone to stop me. If you're not with me, if I'm losing you, if you want to challenge what I'm saying. The other thing that I've stressed every time we've been together is don't take anything on my authority. I'm going to share some things with you that have been of value to me. But if they don't harmonize with what your inner teacher says, or what I call your direct connection with the Aikikami, uh, I would never abandon my connection with my inner teacher. Or uh, as O-sensei said, I, I, I I may lose my center, but I recognize it sooner and I get back quicker. Staying aligned with this impulse to breathe, with the direct connection with the force of life itself, I think is the essence of our work. And I think it's what allows each of us to play our part in the symphony. And if we do that and we play it well, then the symphony is beautiful. Now, the last piece of that, never abandon your inner teacher, is these are my stories. You have to experience them yourself to know if they're true for you. So let's just take a last minute here, give you a chance without my voice to just listen to your impulse to breathe and seek the source of it. And if you need to stop me before we move on, because this isn't making sense or what I'm saying isn't true for you. And I'm assuming that everyone is feeling this travel vehicle have its effect, this shift in dimensional awareness, or that if I put it really simply, you feel a little bit different. Okay? I can't emphasize enough to you how important I think it is that you stay with this more than anything I'm going to say to you, more than anything else we're going to do. If you're staying in this connection, I'm talking to you that I think can hear me. And not really me, but the me that I wish I was sharing. All right. I'm going to go into motion now. Um, I'd like to do some exercises. I'm going to go stand up. I would certainly invite you to do the same. 
Uh, but these can be done to a large degree sitting. So however you're most comfortable. And I will do my best to remind you to come back to the impulse to breathe. But, um, you know, like I have a, a thing, take it a little easy here. It says, you know, minus 10% because uh, I tend to be a little intense. And you may want to put a sign up that reminds you to breathe or breathe consciously or connect to that force. All right. So standing or sitting, let's do a short moment of what we would call standing meditation. And if you're sitting, that's fine too. And if I move too quickly, and I probably will, and you need me to slow down, feel free to punch in and, and let me know. But I'm guessing that that was enough time for as you start to pay attention to whatever you pay attention to when you're in this place and quiet down, you also felt a dimensional shift or a travel vehicle to the next dimension or something. Something changed in your awareness or how you feel. Okay? So all these Tricks of the trade are ways to get us into something that's a little different than where we were. And I would venture to guess that you share my experience as I do this. My level of, here's a funny word here, presence increases. My capability of being aware of what's going on in the moment. Bob talked yesterday a lot about uh, the people who thought they could attack O-sensei and stuff, and, and uh, he would, you know, feel that. And I always thought that the reason I was training was not because I ever thought I was going to put a Nikyo on a 300-pound guy, but because I thought I was going to be able to leave the bar before he knew he wanted to hit me. And much more important than that, that I'm listening to, I talked to a friend yesterday, um, he called it listening to life, I like that, because uh, I tend to call it listening to the Aikikami, but I'm afraid that puts us into some mystical zone for some people, and I don't mean to do that. All right, so I'm going to now ask you to enliven your, and I'll do opposite, so because I'm thinking I'm mirrored to you, but enliven your right side a little bit. Just feel it, extra sensory acuity, whatever it is. You might even want to wave your arm a little bit or move it or something. And wiggle the leg a little bit. Just really enliven your right side. Stay with the breath because that will help you dimensionally hit a finer level of perceiving what I'm talking about and what you yourself are experiencing. Okay, let's play with the left side, enlivening the left side, the leg, the arm, really the torso. Even you can play into the half of the head as it were. And Feeling that, heightening your sensory acuity, paying more attention to it. And I'm going to add this other piece we worked on. I played with the audible breath, the silent breath, and the invisible breath, where at first you can hear it, then you can feel it, but you can't hear it. And then it hits a point where it's so subtle, you neither hear nor feel the air moving. You feel your chest expand and all that, but as far as the passages go, you don't feel it, you don't hear it, it's invisible and yet you're breathing. When you start to hit that level of breath, you'll also start to notice very quickly, and certainly if I point it out to you, that you feel the vitality in your cells. You're actually feeling the oxygen exchange at the cellular level, at a much finer dimension. And let's do that once more on the right. And silent breath, if you can get there, and invisible breath, if you can get there. Feel the glow of aliveness, the vitality, the oxygenation exchange at that cellular level. And on the left side, using that invisible breath, if you can get there, and just as fine as you play it. And I'm fascinated these days with that borderline between the audible and the silent, the silent and the invisible. Anything that helps you bring your attention into your experience, and that's my 
catchphrase for our game here, connecting your attention with your experience. Uh, Bob talks a lot about the eye going off or the awareness of the thinking as it separates from experience, but the experiential presence of what we're doing, and it's why our Aikido is such a great practice because it activates the physical, the sinews, which is an aspect of our being. It's not the whole thing, and a lot of people miss that. Uh, and, then, and the spiritual people kind of miss that it's an important part of our being. They miss that. It's the combination of the attention with the experience, of the conscious awareness with that spiritual awareness. And I use that word because it causes us to breathe. It's the vitality of life itself. So I'm going to invite you now, last time, right side, just a little extra acuity, if that's the right word, and the left side just a little bit. And I'm going to expand them out a little bit further than they normally go, just to increase that sensory awareness. And then I'm going to ask you to start tracing just in feeling, in sensation, in actually almost feels like your imagination, which that's the way it feels to the heavier dimension as you start to move into a finer dimension. Am I imagining this? I want you to imagine coming in in sensory awareness to that place where the two sides meet. Now those of us in Aikido would immediately call this center or use a term similar to that. But I want you to start now to refine that a little bit. And in the way we polish the edge of a sword until the two sides of the sword in effect come together so finely that it, it cuts. And in this case, cuts through our awareness of the two separate parts into a unified field. Stay with the impulse to breathe, connecting with the source or the origin of that impulse, always aligned with your inner teacher, uh, you can almost ignore my words, sort of, and just play with whatever interests you. And if my words help stimulate that for you, listen to me at that level. And I have put a lot of time in. I hope I can be of some assistance here, but I don't mean to ever say I know. I kind of think, I sort of imagine, I kind of sense, feel. And this is as far as I've gotten, and these are my stories. You have to experience it for yourself to find out what's true for you. So I'm going to give you a little game here to play with, and that's in the center of your torso, around the spine, if you could imagine contracting the muscles that hold the spine. And probably all the muscles in the body may contract a little bit, and that's fine. I'm not worried about that right now. And you'll also find that as you do that, uh, I'll give you my example. You'll, yours may be different, but I think you can use it. Um, my contraction pretty much goes right in the, uh, what do we call it, the lumbar region. And it takes me a little more attention to compress in the thoracic region. And then I have to actually consciously think about it to get my cervical region muscles to tighten. I hope you're with me. Stop me if you're not. The impulse to breathe, your connection to your inner teacher or the divine kami or however you want to think about it, the universe, the force, and that contraction and releasing it. And again, that contraction and releasing it. And let's really go into the release now. Staying with the breath, releasing the muscles. And now I'm going to describe it this way, relaxing the muscles closer and closer to the spine. So we're going right side, left side, coming into the center. We're using the trick, if you want to call it that, or the travel vehicle of contracting the muscles closer and closer to the spine. And again, I want to play with the full length of the spine, so I spend a little extra attention making sure that you don't have to squeeze that hard, just contract the muscles a little bit, and then release and relax the muscles 
closer and closer to the spine, coming in from the right, coming in from the left. And now I want you to find that very central core of your being. And here's the game I want to play with for just a minute. As you come to where the two sides seemingly come together or the, the blade edge of the sword, that is your spine or your center line at a finer dimension of energy, that edge of the sword that we use to cut I'm just playing a game here. It's a little thought experiment. That's all. It's not a big deal. Is that both sides of the sword or is that neither side of the sword? And watch your, with a little Zen koan there. Watch your mind play with that for a minute. And then I'd play back to our standing on the floating bridge, uniting heaven and earth, uniting left and right, uniting uh, mind and body, the body with the earth itself. Let's say that central line there is both and neither. It's its own experience. And if you'll play with it for just a minute more, it becomes a travel vehicle. It takes you to the next dimension or the next person as character as Bob likes to call it. Something that's embodied here, that's present and alive and includes the corporal sense and the thought realm as well. And it's connected through the somatic, the feeling awareness, all right? And let's go into some motion here a little bit. And again, I wanna pause for a moment and say, if you're not with me, if you have a problem or question with where I am, let's stop and talk about it for a minute because it's only gonna get worse as we complicate the practice. But there's just a fundamental of shifting into a unified field, mind, body, spirit, whatever you want to call it, corpus, psyche, soma, left, right, center. We could play front, back. Maybe we want to do that for just a minute and then find the place that's in the center of the front and the back. But this is experiential. It's a feeling. Where do you feel that connection? And we could also play up and down. And one of the ways I like to play that one, like we did contracting the muscles, is actually just lift yourself up a little bit. Sink yourself down a little bit. Come up, come down, come up, come down. You hit that spot where is it up and down? Is it neither up nor down? Is it center? What word do we want to use? Okay. So all those practices, and I leave this to you, and it'll be there in the video for reference and possibly in the notes. I don't know if I'm going to do notes this week, but these practices that you can take because um, that's where it really starts to happen. I I was going to make the theme a little bit different this time, and, and I almost did by saying that this week the focus is it's your art now. Oh, Sensei's gone. Bob and I are running out of time. And I suspect I'll run out before he does, if I know him. And, um, but however long we're here with you, and however much time we can spend together, you're going to spend a lot more time on your own. And if you have these practices, connecting to the breath, connecting to your inner teacher, seeking the source of the breath, at that point, all these exercises will be taught to you by the Aikikami or your inner self, or the voice of life. Okay? All right, so let's have some fun with the movement, and we might as well play in our Aikido sense here. I've got a punch coming towards my face, all right? And here's my game. I'm going to just move slightly and bring my hand here to guide that hand by me. I hope you can see that well enough. I'm just going to move off the line. And if that punch is coming in, I'm going to use my hand to just brush it by me. Let me see if I can come in a little closer so you can see that really well. And, okay. And it's not a big uh, upward or downward block, sideways block, uh, inner or outer. 
it's just the gentlest guidance of that movement as I slide my body forward and off the line. All right, pretty simple move. Let's not make a big deal out of it. Okay, let's make a big deal out of, if I did my connection to my breath, I've already got a dimensional shift going. If I did my relaxing the muscles closer and closer to the spine, now there'd be all sorts of physical stuff like uh, the columns will open, the cerebral spinal fluid will drain a bit off the pressure of the head, you know, that feeling where you just need some space. If you can do that quick tighten and release, as that release goes on, the cerebral spinal fluid can drain into where it should be, filling in between the discs and the vertebrae and keeping you flexible and present instead of that feeling like you're too pressured in the head, okay? So all this stuff is happening, and then the one I want to play with, and I, I think we'll try and give focus to it next week, but I'll mention it as I tend to do, introducing it ahead of time. The, um, can you picture the shadow of your weight? Okay, you can imagine sunlight causing a shadow on the surface of the floor or what, ground or whatever, that your weight is going into the earth. And if you can imagine it dispersing and creating kind of a shadow of the weight and actually the earth absorbing or receiving or coming up to support you any way you want to look at it, there's something in that depth. I, I like the phrase, the power beneath the mat. So I'm giving you a lot. Uh, but I'd come back and say connecting your attention with your experience that's all we're talking about. When I went from moving from the uh, lumbar to the thoracic to the cervical area in the spine, those are just ways of differentiating uh, left and right. Those are just ways of differentiating to get us more attuned. As soon as you are, if you could get me to shut up and just have a moment of quiet, these things would start talking to you. That's what I want to play with now. So here comes a punch. I'm moving slightly off the line. I'm guiding it by me. And I'm going to do one more. And what I really care about, like I said, this is no big deal. But what I really care about is this state that I've moved into a much finer dimension. I can feel their intention to swing their hand before they can move it. And I've already started moving. And uh, I think Bob used to say, I mean, actually, we had some discussions about when you watch uh, the movies, it, uh, oh, Sensei movies, he moves, and then, and then you see the guy move with his punch or something like that. I think oh, Sensei described the same thing, that he would feel the spiritual bullet, and then he would move, and the real bullet would follow that. And what I've said over and over again is, I don't do I body do. Uh, Mr. Sautom used to joke about that. I thought it was a great line. I do Aikido. And what is key? And I, you know, been over this with people who, who don't know what the word means and have some picture of it that it some kind of mystical power somewhere else and don't believe in it or don't get it. Uh, key is the energy that activates the body. If you haven't been here, I'll go over it quickly. In order to move your hand, you must have the intention to move your hand. You must send that intention to your nerve. Your nerves must send that intention to your muscles so they can contract and move the body. And that flow of neural energy is how I term it for those of us who are uh, less inclined to the spiritual, is key. Okay? So I want to do that movement. And I want to keep everything that we've been talking about happening. And I want to keep my attention connected to all that so it can't any longer be a linear process. You've got to be in heaven and earth at the same time. You've got to be thinking and feeling at the same time. You've got to be breathing and moving at the same time. You've got to be connected to heaven and earth at the same time. You've got to be feeling your body and the, can I call it the gravity shadow, the weight of your body as it's connected to the earth at the same time. And if we were going to go deeply into it, we'd recognize that the earth is suspended in a universal 
force spinning around the sun, spinning around the galaxy, spinning in heaven knows what. All right, so we're connecting to that totality as we do this simple movement. All right? And I think by now we're ready to do it on the other side. And on that one, already had almost no gravity shadow. I was definitely leaning forward into the thing. Uh, I had lost my breath. And this one's already markedly better, although not quite as good as the last one on the other side. I hope you're still with me. I hope you'll stop me if you're not. So I'm very interested now in this Relaxing the muscles closer and closer to the spine as I listen to the impulse to breathe. In feeling left, right, and that center line all the way down to the shadow of my gravity, of my weight. That there's a full, fullness that's almost impossible to describe in words because they're so linear. So we use floating bridge of heaven. I like the term unified field of Ike or unified field of being. Everything's happening all at once. All right, so we're gonna move here. And I now have my hand against their, their arm. And I'm just feeling where their arm is going. And I'm picking up their body. For me this time, this particular imaginary uke is requesting an arimi nage. That's because I'm the waiter and they're the customer. Okay, I'm not telling them what technique they should want. I don't tell people what they should order in my restaurant. I come in, I go, what would you like? And this time, I'm moving more into a Nikio. Okay, that's because that's what my uke wanted. I'm moving into what we would call kokinage, and I want to come back to this one. And I hope you're doing something with your ukes now, and not necessarily what my uke is doing but just something. And then what I always have to do, I always resist it at first, is I have to slow myself down because I tend to talk faster than my uke wants to move. I tend to start guessing what my customer would like. And I have to come back in and say, what would you like? and be there for a minute while they stare at the menu or decide what they're gonna do in response to my movement. I'm picking up the elbow here. I'm getting very much a nikyo. Oh, it's turning into a kaitanage. And if you're not an Aikido person or you haven't trained much, it doesn't matter. Just move off the line and feel your partner and see where you wanna move. Don't worry about doing a technique or throwing them since they don't really exist anyway. Okay. So if you're finding some play with your partner, that's all I care about. I want you to get some movement going on. And then I want you to watch how quickly that movement becomes more important. And all the stuff we're working on goes away. We become involved in our daily life and making money and trying to find a partner and trying to keep our kids happy and getting the car fixed, and we somehow lose this connection. We were just so beautifully there a moment ago, weren't we all? Uh, let's see now, I'm connecting the impulse to breathe. Oh, that feels so much better already. And then, you know, oh yeah, my shadow, my gravity shadow, I can feel myself connected to under the mat, to something much more than my usual identity. And, oh yeah, yeah, I can feel, my, my sense of the earth is part of a total universal system and that I'm part of that. And then I'm back to, you know, trying to fix dinner. And I'm playing with the idea of I'm fixing dinner, I'm doing my uke, I'm serving my customer, I'm handling my life in this place where the spiritual practice is equally as valued, is equally in balance. And Bob, I was talking with Bob uh, yesterday. We had kind of a nice conversation. I was working on this paper, which I'll make available to you. And Bob was incredibly helpful. Um, just unbelievable, actually, after all these years uh, that he could kind of, I just felt like a beginner all over again in a certain way. It was really great. But, but this sense of as soon as you hit a point of balance between these two forces, 
And I don't want to say that is standing on the floating bridge. I want to say that's an approach to standing on the floating bridge. When you actually are feeling your breath and the conscious you and the unconscious you is breathing together as one system. When your enjoyment and your movement are all happening together, when your movement and that inner stillness, that relaxation of the muscles closer to the spine, that a gravity shadow, if I can use that term again, are all happening at the same time. Okay, I think I'm just feeling so good with this, I'm gonna invite a second uke in. Now I'm working with two ukes. I just put the one between me and the other one, if you can see that. Probably you're busy with your own ukes right now, but. And then I'm just gonna take a minute and because what I really care about is not my imaginary ukes all that much, although I have a lot of fun with them, is how I'm affected by my involvement in doing everything I imagine that's part of my life. Okay? So like now it's feeling pretty good again. I feel like I'm with my breath. I did lose the spine a little bit or that, that opening in the central core, but I could still feel the shadow of my gravity and my movement all at the same time. There's a, what I call stillness in motion in the sense that something doesn't change even though you're doing this. And I'd say if we kept this up long enough or if we have a lot of time, we might take a, a particular set of movements or something and then increase the speed uh, or the intensity or something like that. But um, I think that's kind of where I wanted to go with it. Let's take a last minute here. Give yourself one really good uke. Just have some fun with them. And stay with your practice, your connection to your inner teacher or the source of breath and the origin of that. And I used to do a form I called Aiki Dance. Uh, one of my roommates was a dancer and we used to play together a lot and we actually put this system together in which we completely took the martial aspect out of the question. It was completely about having fun, the way a dancer does. But we were able to use this tuning into this finer energy in the same way that, uh, let me invite you to the Aiki Dialogue on Monday night. Um, we're going to be playing with it maybe for a couple more weeks. We'll see. But, but we'll definitely do one more tomorrow, uh, Monday night. Uh, we play with a way of communicating, but still operating with this connection to the source of the impulse to breathe, connected to our gravity shadow, if you will. And it's why when my uke comes and pushes on me right now, I'm immovable. They can't move me. And the more power they put out, the more I'm able to lead it into a resolution. And because my male and female, masculine and feminine, yin and yang are in harmony and working together, my in-breath and out-breath are working as a system, I not only am quote-unquote immovable in the sense that I only move when I want to move, um, or I move in a larger sense that way, but that I'm able to deal with them in a way that's uh, respectful, peaceful, uh, non-injurious. Having a little computer glitch here, but I'm hoping you're still hearing me okay. All right, so here's your last, last uh, uke attack, and then we're gonna come back and talk together a little bit. So really enjoy this one. I think I'm going to bring in a third attacker right now. And 
for those of you who are a little bit older or the rest of you who are getting older, these kinds of play, uh, this kind of allowing yourself to do what you need keeps your range of motion, keeps your channels open if you're into the acupuncture, tai chi, qigong world. And I feel like there's a critical piece to me in the gravity shadow. And I think you'll find that as you continue with your seeking the source of the impulse to breathe, that piece becomes a larger part of your awareness. And then I'm going to come back to a moment, short moment of where we started, left, right, center, contracting the muscles closer to the spine, relaxing the muscles closer and closer. And I kind of almost see like a bullseye, kind of the rings on a target, closer and closer until there's just kind of an opening and you can imagine or pretend that you can, the spinal, cerebral spinal fluid filling into the gaps and actually elongating the spine, filling in the gaps between the discs and the vertebrae. And I'm with a pretty good sense of enjoyment here. I hope you're feeling something in that realm, but just a, an ease maybe would be a, a simpler word. Kind of a, a calm as I, as I start to settle back into this. Now I, I feel on some level like we could go on for a long time here. Um, I assuming you're kind of having fun with this and um, I guess I'd say let's let's do that but let's let's push it to next week a little bit um, as we're what are we coming up on quarter of and uh, we can go a little past five and whatever but I I know we often turn into this point where it becomes um, questions and uh, and that's fine I, I have put in my time I um, studied a lot of arts besides Aikido. I put in endless hours on the mat. I've studied, you know, my arts, music and dance and poetry and whatnot. And, um, and I do want to share whatever I can give you to make you more capable of doing Aikido or dance or poetry or cooking. <laughs> so it's more fun for you. I'm happy to answer your questions, but at the same time, I'd come back to the questions that I asked you in the beginning, which were, What's important? What do you want? And in terms of where our study has been for whatever time you've been with me, and I know for some of you that's a lot of years, but, but for some of you it's probably just one or two classes. What did you learn? What did you learn that you weren't expecting or that surprised you? And what were you hoping you'd learn or what didn't you learn that you thought you might or that you'd like to touch on if we go on for a few more weeks, which it looks likely that we will. So I'm going to invite you to come back to your breath, listening to that impulse, breathing with it, listening to it so that you and the impulse to breathe are actually the same identity, which is now a different identity than the you that signed in. And I'm guessing we've had a number of shifts dimensionally there. I think I'm gonna stop now. I have a couple more places that are kind of knocking, but I think I'd like to hear from you now, if you would be willing. And um, no big deal. Uh, please keep it as simple as you can because I know we can get into some conversations here that, that would take us hours. But uh, if you can hit the high points for you of what did you learn, what would you like to learn, what surprised you, and again, what is it that you want? What's important to you? Who are you in this thing? And I, I guess I'll say one more phrase here. Studying with all the teachers I studied with was good, good stuff. and 
going and working with other people is good stuff. You can learn a lot of tricks about how to fix a car, how to cook a meal, how to do an Aikido technique. I'm not trying to discourage any of that. I encourage more of that than probably any of you are going to find time to do. But my voice here with you is very much about make sure there's a time when you go out and sing your song, when you write your own song, when you design your own dance or your own stretching exercise, or you play with the recipe and make it a little more the way it just feels right to you at the moment. So I say, when I cook it, I cook it the way I like it. I'm encouraging you to do that. That's all. I'm not saying don't follow recipes or don't use cookbooks or don't go to other people's classes. So I'm open to any comments that you have. And in the back of my mind, I don't know if you're with us, Lauren, but I am here. I have a question. I have a question for you, which is last week you asked me what's the role of the teacher and hearing everything that we've said today. I'll leave you with that question if and when you'd care to share something. I'd add that question back for you because I, I feel you have a lot to share in those realms as well. well uh, hey, Richard, yeah, thank, please. Thank you for the wonderful class and uh, the invisible uke practice. Um, uh, I am happy to address that question that I asked last week, but first I want to ask you a question, a personal question. Please. Here in front of all 27 participants. You mentioned that you started, you, you were talking in the beginning about how you'd done yoga and how you did Aikido and that you, you undertook, you took them up both to help you with your music. Mm -hmm. So tell us about Aiki music. What is the connection that you found between Aikido practice and music? Let me tr try and answer it this way, because it's, it's a beautiful question in a way for, for me. I, you know, I love it. Um, the, uh, everybody knows who Hank Williams is, right? Hank Williams said, you don't write songs, they're given to you. And the thing that I love about songwriting, if, if I dare call what I do songwriting, I like to call it composition because it's so lofty, but um, some of you have heard some of my songs might question that. Uh, it's, it's not having a song that I've written. It's the process of writing the song. And, and most importantly, it's that impulse to write. It's like whatever it is when the divine uh, or the force or the energy that is life speaks through me. And all of a sudden I find myself writing a song. And that's also true when I play a solo. And to some degree, even when I play a classical piece, the fact that I'm feeling it in a certain way and playing it in a way that, you know, um, anybody who is knowledgeable in the field would know that that's not the way it sounds when so-and-so plays it. That it's, it's something very unique of your own expression comes through. And it's like I said, I feel like each of us is part of this symphony of life. And if each of us could get kind of listen well enough to really get on key with who we are and our bestowed mission in Osensei's words. And we all brought that to the symphony in this spirit of reconciliation of not one person playing louder or uh, being able to stay in rhythm together or something. There's something so magical that happens for me. And, um, and I guess what I'd say is I, I was talking to uh, Richard Heckler uh, a while back when I said, you know, I just, I thought I was just going to take a couple classes of Aikido and it would help me with my music. And it just took me about 45 years. And then all of a sudden now I don't teach much. Uh, I don't play on the mat that much. I still love it. I'm getting a little old, but, but I still love the kinesthetic aspect. But all of a sudden about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I started moving back into the music and all the stuff I learned in Aikido, um, has affected me there and very much in terms of the sound that I'm able to bring forward. And, um, and also very much in the interactions with the other people. So I, I don't want to say much more based on our time sequence, but we can pick this up, you know, offline if you want more, or if there's anything specific I missed, uh, let me know. But I hope that gets close to giving you something to play with. 
Thank you for sharing. Thank you for asking. And so the question you posed to me was what, but, but you, 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 I posed it to you and you posed it back to me. The question is That's what the way the, I am. What is the role of the teacher? If, if the true essence of Aikido comes from direct experience, which I believe it does, what is the role of the teacher? And um, like you, I have studied with uh, many teachers, um, Hombu Dojo, Saotome Sensei, Terry Dobson, Hikizuchi Sensei, Ano Sensei, and for the last 20 some years, Nabe Sensei. And um, the teacher is, to, is the teacher's role besides organizing and leading the class so that there's not mayhem, is to show the student what is possible to show the student the right form, the right posture, to encourage them in their strengths and to uh, have them process through their weaknesses um, and to uh, encourage the students when they need it to apparently in my case to kick them in the ass when they need it uh, <laughs> to be uh, because the, the teacher is only half the relationship of the student teacher relationship when I've been in many dojos where people have complained to me, grumble, grumble, grumble about the teacher. And uh, my answer is always, the student only has a few things to choose. One of them is the teacher. The student chooses their teacher. And once they do that and they say, please teach me, then the teacher has to say, okay, I will teach you. I, I think that you're sincere enough in your request to teach me that I will share with you. I will put my energy as a teacher into you as a student and we'll have a relationship. And, and you agree to be a student and I agree to be a teacher. And when that doesn't work out, generally speaking, you need to get divorced, right? Because it's too intimate a relationship. The best teachers recognize that everybody's different and they don't teach the same Aikido to different people the same way. Everybody needs, has strengths and weaknesses. People are short, they're tall, they're quick, they're slow. Uh, and, uh, uh, but a teacher fundamentally shows that there is a path and that what the student can't, may not be able to do right now, the teacher shows the student that it is possible if you go through the process to be able to do something we call Aikido, something quite wondrous. And, you know, until the student tastes that themselves, the teacher is there to assure them that this is a viable path. And, uh, and because all the teachers I know, myself, Richard Moon, Bob Noha, I see on this call, everybody started as a white belt. They weren't born a teacher. They were even the doshu, who was born in full expectation that he'd be the doshu, went through training. And this training is not just the physical training, but the shugyo, the inner training, the self-development process, the ascetic training. And a good teacher can really help a student with their shugyo. And uh, I know that uh, uh, what you've been showing us today, Richard, is uh, the heart of that. It's the inner process. And uh, so I think that's the role of the teacher 
And uh, what do you think? Much appreciated. Much appreciated. I, I'm going to want to give a little space to others if indeed you'd like to share something of your experience here or responding to those questions. I did see the question about the role of Uke and Nage. And to that, I would say, you know, we're not competing like they are in other arts. We're doing something almost completely different. And that Uke and Nage are both practicing Aikido, being centered, being grounded, extending ki, blending, flowing, working in harmony. And the thing that Osensei described was loving attack, peaceful reconciliation. I think what distinguishes the Uke and Nage's role is that it's incumbent on Nage to make it better, to produce a better outcome than what might have happened if the two of us had spoken together and neither one of us took responsibility for that, if we both just argued about who was right. So I'm going to let that one go and say, Lauren, again, thank you. And everyone else who would like to contribute, I'd love to hear anything you'd like to share at this point. We'll go another, whatever, 15, 20, whatever you want. I mean, I'm fine. Since I had a question, um, one is about, you mentioned something about gravity shadow. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to hear more about that if I could. Well, as you feel yourself, I'm guessing you're sitting at this point and your weight is going into the chair. And the chair is being held up by the floor or the ground or whatever. If you can imagine where that weight goes into the earth, if you can feel, and again, it's, it's an imaginary sense in a way, and yet I do believe it's actual. If you can feel that weight distribute into the earth, and you feel that connection that you have, you don't float about in empty space. You're always in this sense of gravitational relationship with the larger universe, the earth itself, the earth with the solar system, and so on and so forth. And so I would say, as I did to Lauren last week when he asked his question, play with that. And uh, when you come back next week, tell me what you got. All right, thank you. I guess my, my follow-up, I did have a second thing, it was just more of a general interest of what Lauren was, was, was saying as well just caught my attention about, I think hearing more from you about in, in a subsequent class, you know, just about what was the blend of Aikido and music for you? And I think the reason I'm asking is I'm realizing I, I've been, I've been doing a lot of like reverse engineering of things of, of that and to, to kind of see it from your perspective for your art, I think would help me understand how to bring Aikido into the creative practice more generally. And so how you did it in your, in your specific context of, of, of music, I think would, would be, I'd be very interested in hearing more about that at some point. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna hold on to that one. Um, and we will talk more about the power under the mat next week and the gravity shadow, et cetera. Um, but good, good enough. I, I did touch on that a little response to Lauren's question, but I'll, I'll see what I can come back with about that. Let me offer the space to anyone who'd like to share what their experience or questions or thoughts are. Uh, Richard, this is Lauren again, and I see on the chat that there's still some discussion about Uke and Nage, and I'd like to chime in and just say that both Uke and Nage are generally referred to in Japanese as aite, partners, right? Mm -hmm. And the only time you really hear uke and nage in a Japanese dojo is if the teacher calls you out and wants to be clear about who's gonna be the thrower and who's gonna be the receiver or the attacker, whatever you wanna call it. Mm -hmm. It's not like there's always these two roles. There's just partners and they go through a, a, a motion, a waza, by agreement for the sake of practice, right? 
it, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's as you have said today, in reality, much more spontaneous and free form and, and uh, uh, with, with no forethought just in that moment. So it's, it's, it's an artificial the division between what's the role of Huke and what's the role of Nage and which is better and which is up and which is down is an artificial division. They're just Aite, which for Nado Sensei, he calls this relationship, right? You're in relationship with your Aite, with your partner. So mm -hmm. I wanted to contribute that and I hope it helps people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Say something. Hi, my name's Dusty. Uh, thank you. I have been in one of these classes. I couldn't help but think of um, George Leonard and the Silent Pulse, uh, who didn't have the privilege of meeting George, but I consider him a teacher. So I pulled the book off my shelf, and the subtitle of his book is "The Perfect Rhythm That Exists Within Each of Us." So I like that listening to the impulse to breathe because it's like coming from this deeper place. You talked about the word intention, and I like that because that's like freedom there. It's flowing, uh -huh. it's coming from an in good intentions. So thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that's, that's some nice uh, resonance there. Great, I appreciate that. I did know George and uh, trained with him a lot back in the old days. Uh, Richard, if I may, what's come up for me in my practice lately is uh, joy. And um, I, in my conversation with my inner teacher, I ask it to lead me with joy, meaning that um, if I am on the right path, I hope to experience joy. And that if I should deviate from that path, I would hope to be able to feel that by feeling less joy. And I feel like occasionally uh, my inner teacher has needed a, uh, I say two by four, um, to hit me in wherever. <laughs> um, and uh, the conversation I try to stay in is, okay, yeah, I get that's the wrong path, but I try to keep myself open to a, a simpler, a gentler guide than um, I have needed at times. That's... Yeah, yeah, no, I, I mean, I think uh, those of you who've been here have heard me repeat this quote from Osensei that Mr. Hikazuchi brought back to us. Love gives birth to harmony, harmony brings forth joy, and joy is the greatest treasure. And I think what you're describing here is um, the sense that I was also talking about that we get so caught up in fixing the car, cooking the meal, correcting the kid, whatever, um, that we lose this essential connection that radiates joy. And when that happens, we get mad at everybody around us. I, I love Bob's comment yesterday when he did his little exercise, you know, calling up the energy and, and then saying, get ready to do 20 sit-ups and then don't. And he said, people get mad at me because that energy comes up. Learning how to reconcile with that energy, that's been the essence of the art for me because when I'm in that place, I've left the bar before I even realized they want to hit me and long before they realize it. I've just moved in a way that's harmonious with a larger system. So I'm, I'm right with you there. And all I would say is, aren't we all a little thick sometimes? And the heavier the dimension we're operating from and the more tense we get and the less um, we allow the cerebral spinal fluid to flow and the more it pressures the brain and oh, we could go to a million after effects, as Bob calls them. But coming into relationship with our energy where we're accomplishing our bestowed mission it's almost inevitable. It seems to me completely natural that we'll help everyone else accomplish their bestowed mission. And uh, I was watching uh, Bob Noah's class the other day. He was talking to the students about dealing with difficult ukes. And I was saying, I think they're showing us where our idea of what's supposed to happen 
is no longer what's supposed to happen. And learning to feel and go with that flow in a way that still stays with our gravity shadow, with our impulse to breathe, that unified field, standing on the floating bridge. However, we want to talk about shifting to the dimension of, you know, connected, balance, whatever words we're going to use. I think it's almost inevitable that that working in the flow is why we enjoy Aikido. And I would say it's there for people who train other arts. It's just not the central focus the way that I think it is, or at least should be for us. If you've got a comment or two, if there's something you'd like to share, if you want to bring, you know, uh, in my comment, once you're feeling where you are and you're in harmonious relationship, sharing who you are is the essence of Aikido. It's just that a lot of people do it when they aren't feeling where they are and when they're out of harmony with the situation. And then it's definitely something else. So please, if there's something left, let's spend a minute with it. And if we're done, we can wrap it up. Hi, Richard, Joanna. Uh, thank Hi, you Joanna. For today's practice, it was very deep and very, very gentle, um, very special. And uh, while I was moving I, with my imaginary partners, I almost felt that I was in, in the middle of a juaza. It was very good, and then a lot of move. So I think the uh, your class, like infinitive creativity, can go like endless. So thank you very much. Keep going with that. Hope to do a lot, practice a lot of juazas here. Yeah, juaza was the essence of our practice, and what I want to say to you, Joanna, and to everyone again, is don't wait till next week get some imaginary ukes and have some fun. Um, get in the habit of generating these practices for yourself from your own connection with the, I like the word divine, but with the force um, and, and enhancing that connection by playing with these expressions of it. Uh, again, I'm really happy to share my contribution with you and help you get into it. But I can't encourage you enough to make your direct connection. And uh, so do these practices on your own. And even that will enhance our time together, you know, if and when we're able to do this again. Thank I will you. Absolutely. Thank you. Hi, Richard. It's Mike from New Zealand. Uh, first, just like to say great class. Thank you very much. Um, Adding to Lauren's comments about the role of the teacher. Um, Please. The part of the teacher's role, a big part is to listen and learn. Um, listening mm -hmm. in, in the terms that you've been presenting is what I mean, because Aikido is not a rigid thing, it's a fluid thing. And even as the teacher, you can't demand that the uh, UK in inverted commas, does what you want you've got to listen to what they're giving you even if it's not what you asked them to give you and accept it and receive it and usually that involves uh, or not usually sometimes involves going somewhere where you know that i the teacher haven't been before and trusting the process because i strongly believe that the teacher always learns and i think that's one of the gifts we can give to the students is that they can see that we are continuing to learn and therefore the students can believe that by continuing to practice they too will move along the path i'm 100 percent in harmony with that yeah very much so like i said my favorite compliment ever was i wasn't teaching i was just learning out loud so are we still there can you still hear me Absolutely. Yes, we can. Anybody else? And Bob Noah, I know you're out there, and I, I know you've got to be thinking something. And, you know, Bob Noah was uh, Bob Nadeau's first student to achieve the rank of black belt. I mean, he goes back further than I do. And, uh, you know, also one of the most sincere students of the arts I've ever met. And so I'm, I'm just poking you a little bit, Bob. I don't want you to feel compelled to speak, but I do want you to feel more than welcome, encouraged. Yeah, thank you, Richard. First, it was a tremendous class. 
you get to the essence of things as well as anybody does, and you certainly did today. When Lauren was talking about the role of the teacher in the uke, it reminded me of kind of how I got started being interested in, in spiritual things to begin with. Uh, when I was young, I was an altar boy, and maybe unlike some of my colleagues who were altar boys, it was something I actually liked doing. Uh, but I was always asking the priests a lot of questions, and if suicide wasn't a mortal sin, I think I might have driven them, some of them, in that direction. But I remember asking <laughs> priests one time, uh, Father, what, what, what do you do when, when somebody tells you uh, they've heard God speak to them? And the priest said, I never tell them they didn't. Yes, the, if they say that, I tell them, yes, that, that's what happened. And the first time I went to Japan and saw a lot of Osensei students who were still teaching there at the time, they were all doing different things, just like you were encouraging us to do here. Almost as if you wonder, gee, are these people practicing the same art as each other? And the conclusion I came to from thinking about that is that Osensei as a teacher, and, and in a certain sense is their uke, because in the Koryu, the old arts of Japan, the teacher plays the role of uke, not of nage. Almost as their uke, he didn't try to make people carbon copies of himself. He encouraged them along their own natural arc of development to be the best possible version of themselves they could be. And I think that's a lot of what the role of the teacher is. I love that. So I thank you that. for encouraging that. Thank you for being here. Great to see you always. And if this is Lauren again, if I can respond to Bob. I was, I was always noticed that every great teacher was different from O Sensei, but consistent with O Sensei. That if those of us who remember him, Terry Dobson's Aikido and Robert Nadeau's Aikido, their style, their how they express it, the their favorite techniques and how they play them, you know, or Sao Tome Sensei or Hikizu Sensei, they're so different from each other, and yet internally completely consistent, because they all did have the same teacher for that inner lesson that that inspired them to become teachers. I found, but what they emphasized, how they played it was really individual to them. And, and O-sensei changed over time. It wasn't like one O-sensei. That uh, the thing that, uh, that people heard from him seems to be different depending upon who was listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm back to my theme here for all of you. And again, all due respect for everyone I've trained with, respect for everyone all of you have trained with, it's your art now. Last couple and then we'll wrap it up. Hi Richard. If there is anything, please. Yeah, um, it's really fun, however distant, but still really immediate. I've been, I've been really playing with, it's been my theme for years, how is it that Aikido really um, manifests in my real life, in my life as I am at a board of directors meeting, as I'm with a client, uh, as I'm teaching students at the university, how is it that my Aikido plays out? And I've been really intrigued by the uke nage type of dynamic. If I'm Professor Catherine, does that automatically make me instructor? Or does it make me uke? And as I respond, I love the comment. Um, if you are serving as uke, does you does that mean you are acting as nage? I think that's a lovely almost koan. Uh, so so playing with how aikido is real when I'm not on the mat, or playing with my energy, or as we were doing today, playing with our imaginary uke or ukes. Um, so that's, that's what I'm, I'm sorting through nowadays as I'm playing with Aikido and I'm complete. Thank you. 
So like I said, I was talking to of a class uh, following this or some event going on that this guy, Bo, has put together. And I was saying to him, you know, none of us are going to get into sword fights, but we practice a little bit with the sword. What are we really studying here? And I would say for most of you, I'll bet you've never used an Aikido technique off the mat. And for those of you who don't know, the only time I've ever done it was to wake my brother up from a coma. I've never had to actually apply a technique. I've been in a few physical situations where I've used my centering and my grounding and my positive energy, but I've never, never gotten into a fight. And um, so what is it that we're really studying? And I think as we look into that question, I don't expect anyone to answer that tonight. We'll go into that more next week. And I hope as we finish up this series, um, really come to the essence of what we're doing here because Again, uh, I had, a, I was just saying, I had this great chat with Bob the other day, and and in the he was help. I was working on a paper, and he was helping me with it. And he said, um, you know, yeah, uh, in the paper I mentioned, I don't believe, you know, that Osensei wanted us all to become martial artists. At least that's what Bob says. And I said to Bob, I said, I always thought you kind of, you know, kind of interpolated that or inferred that from things he said. And what you're telling me now is that no, he was pretty explicit. He was showing us ways that each of us could become who we are and accomplish our bestowed mission, not his bestowed mission. And so I'm, I'm really with that, what you're saying, Catherine, it's just that how does each of us find our part in the symphony? How does each of us bring the richness of the symphony forward together with each other in beauty and, um, and why, you know, I think we all feel a certain sadness in the polarization that we're seeing, uh, political differences, and certainly the religious wars that have gone on from time immemorial. And it's why I believe that, uh, forget Nikio, although it's a fun way to practice the art, uh, it, it's um, this positive frame of relating to each other. Like I said, when you come out of the movie and you didn't like it and they did, how do you work together in a way that allows both of you to be who you are? You don't need to impose your beliefs on anyone else. And you're actually able to enjoy the differences because who would want a symphony that was all tubas all playing the same part, you know? So anyway, I, I, I love it. That's definitely, I'm definitely not here about the fighting aspect. I appreciate that the stronger we are, the more we can protect what's sacred. But I think it, it's, it's a great question to leave with uh, in terms of maybe we can go into it further, but for each of us to be thinking, why am I here? What do I really want? What am I really practicing for? So I appreciate your comments very much. I'd say a last one, uh, maybe two, if there are people, I don't want to cut anybody off if somebody has something to share, but I also want to let you go and have your dinner or whatever you're doing at this point. Uh, Richard, I just want to read you uh, what one of the students uh, wrote that they used Thank Aikido. You, that they used Aikido once in a bar. Someone tried to grab my sister's arm. I used it again to roll safely onto a highway after falling off a wall. Thank you for today's class. I needed to hear everyone's questions and answers. Grateful acceptance and gratitude. I w I really appreciate that. I uh, also use a skateboard. And uh, I use my Aikido role in that sense. I had a couple falls recently uh, coming down from my studio and one off the ladder up here in the studio. And both times I use my Aikido role. So I, I totally relate to using it off the mat in that way. Um, and my only story in the bar was after my brother was uh, in an accident and he was in a coma for a few, I think about four weeks, I, on a, listening to the whisperings of the Aikikami, uh, and this story has been written up and a lot of you have heard it, so I'll try and go quickly. But uh, I just went back and I ended up tuning into the energy. I put a Nikio on him and woke him up from the coma. And then I went back and did some rehab with him using martial arts and whatnot as ways to help him get back. And when he was semi-functional, he wanted to go out and see Mike Murphy, a fantastic piano player at the Triangle Bar or something like that. And in it, there was a guy who was just having some serious problems and started to dump them on my brother, Billy. And I saw it going on. I just could feel the vibe. 
And I just inserted myself between them and just centered and grounded. The guy kept bouncing off me, trying to get me to spark. And I just stood there and protected Billy. And But I didn't have to do anything more than that. And when he realized he couldn't get me to fight, I describe it this way. The half of him that knew he shouldn't be doing it and the all of me that knew he shouldn't be doing it defeated the half of him that was losing control and he stomped out of the bar. And You know, so that was my favorite story of, you know, my martial arts thing, because I, I thought, you know, I certainly didn't want to wake up in the hospital or not wake up. And I certainly didn't want to be sitting there at two in the morning explaining to the police why I killed this explicit deleted asshole. And it just, Aikido was beautiful. I've had a few other instances like that where I've been able to neutralize potentially dangerous situations, but I've never actually had to crank a Nikyo on anyone except to wake my brother up. So I can feel there's one more person who wants to speak right now. Am I imagining it? No. <laughs> I want to thank you for this beautiful class and just to say I'm so appreciating all the connections with um, artistic practice and you've made this beautiful set of questions and, and tools and practices that show us how in any art um, the process and the partner are what bring us out of the small self that's trying to meet this ideal of what should happen. And Beautiful. Technique gets a very bad rap sometimes, but that's <laughs> that's really par so much of what it's there for. And mm -hmm. I, I lost right. a ment I lost a dear mentor uh, just a few days ago, and so hearing that uh, the artist hours now and the gifts of teachers is is very timely. So I'm 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 so grateful for that. Thank you. It's beautiful. Yeah, I lost my uh, first guru last week too interesting times but uh, again um i take what they gave me and i hope you do as well i'm guessing we're kind of complete but if there is anything else feel free to jump in or we can pick it up next week and i think you all have my email address and uh please feel free to contact me if there's anything you need in between i want to highlight Again, the support that Kenneth and Lauren give to this whole process. And really, my thanks to all of you for showing up and, and being so much fun to play with. You were such a good case today. Okay. If we're good, let's wrap it up. And I hope to see you next week. And again, let me invite you to the Ike Dialogue Monday night, 6.30 Pacific time. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Kenneth. Thank you all very, very much.